uh, Cheryl and Brett to go ahead and um, come up here. Um, they are going to start as your panelists for this next, this, um, this opening plenary. Um, I have had the uh, amazing opportunity to not only practice as an attorney in Indian country, but to um, work with NIJA. And um, Cheryl Fairbanks has actually been pretty instrumental in introducing me to uh, a variety of not only uh, attorneys uh, while I was practicing in um, Albuquerque, but to this wonderful organization um, that I work for right now. And um, Cheryl is um, an attorney and she's practicing in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Her practice concentrates primarily on Indian law, but she also serves as a judge for the Intertribal um, Court of Appeals for Nevada. Um, she is she's uh, Plinga and Simpson, and she was born in um, Alaska. And she also serves as an executive member of uh, the board of directors for NIJA. And I um, cannot tell you how much um, she has assisted us in um, bringing together not only um, the panelists for this um, this training, but she's also assisted us with uh, you know theories and how we want to approach this. So um, I'm very happy that she is one of the opening uh, presenters for this plenary. Um, it is also appropriate that Brett Shelton is on this opening plenary as well. Uh, when we were um, deciding on who we wanted to partner with, uh, you know, NARF, for obvious reasons, was at the top of that list. And the fact that they had the peacemaking initiative, um, it, it seemed to be a, a great fit. And so we are very happy to have Brett Shelton assist us and to partner with us um, on this endeavor and this specific training because of the um, specialization that he has there at NARC, not only as an attorney, but also with his work with the um, Peacemaking um, Initiative and that board. And um, Brett, of, of course, is the uh, attorney at NARC, and he uh, is also, he specializes in um, Indian law as well. He works on the Peacemaking Initiative and also Sacred Sites, among other things. So please um, assist me in welcoming both Brett and Cheryl. So I won the coin toss and I'm going first. And, um, actually, I'm not going to talk a whole lot because Cheryl has a really good talk and I really respect what she has to say. It's been a joy working with her bringing this together. And I don't even want to step on any time of hers, but um, I want to talk a little bit about what NARP's been doing just to give you a, a, an introduction, basically, because we've really just gotten the Indigenous Peacemaking Initiative back into a much higher gear over the last year or so. I mean, we've got some exciting stuff going on. Um, the project itself has been around for, boy, at least at least two decades, I think. Now I think they started in about 92. Um, but it's just kind of barely limped along at times, just with funding and, and all of that. But uh, NARC made a serious commitment and opened up a position that basically I ended up lucking into about a year and a half ago or so. And part of the DACA for that position was, was bringing peacemaking forward. So in order to do that, what we did was we looked at a survey that was administered in 2011 to workers in the tribal judicial and justice systems and kind of gauge what we were going to do with the project based on the responses to that survey. And what that survey told us in a nutshell was that people working in tribes in the justice systems wanted samples about peacemaking. First of all, they wanted, to, wanted peacemaking. For those who had peacemaking, it was working well for the most part. Um, needed some more funding, needed some more time, needed more publicity, basically. Um, but what they wanted in assistance from a project like ours was samples of, of other tribes and how they did peacemaking and sample codes, if they had codes and rules, if they had rules and so on. Um, and then they also wanted training and technical assistance. So this is our first opportunity to provide any sort of training through the program. And so I was really appreciative to NIJA for, for coming to us with an RFP. And we initially talked about maybe doing one webinar, um, but NIJA kind of, I guess it was probably the board was so interested in peacemaking that this grew into this. So I'm pretty excited about that as well. And it looks like the timing might be right for any country to, to kind of ramp up peacemaking in general. Um, <clears throat> the technical assistance aspect of what we want to do will come later. Um, it's good to meet some of you guys who are implementing in your tribes, both to learn how you're doing it, learn from you, and hopefully help share that with other tribes. And then if 
there is something that we can do from the legal side. That's where Mark's kind of relevance as attorneys come, comes in. If there's laws that need drafted or you know any kind of writing sort of provisions or legal advice that we can provide, then maybe we can step in and be of assistance in that regard too. Um, we have a website now that's online. Uh, there's a flyer that came in your a little half page color flyer that came in the registration materials that uh, gives the website address and it just tells basically what we do. So we're excited about that. Um, and then I think it's probably proper to introduce myself and what is it about me that, you know, why am I here for a peacemaking training? Um, I don't know that I'm actually qualified to train you guys. You could, I hear a lot of peacemakers here. Um, I do appreciate my Lakota culture and how that works on the ground. Um, and I've, I've tried to not ever lose that when I went to law school and, and beyond too. Um, worked for my tribe for about, to, on my reservation for about 12 years, for my tribe actually for about seven years, um, prior to coming to NARV. Um, and I initially went home and got a job working doing civil legal work for victims of domestic violence. Um, and boy, that really, you know, I, I'd taken a year of mediation. That was a pretty good course in law school. I really liked that. I had volunteered um, in a community mediation service before. I kind of liked the ADR aspect of stuff. But boy, when, when I went home and started doing DB um, work, I, the, the conflict in the system was really obvious, right? I mean, I was dealing with basically guys beating up women, and it, it's rugged at Pine Ridge in that regard. Um, but we had a cutting edge DV program at the time. We really did a good job of, of helping and, and of innovating. And um, I got really good at what I was supposed to do, which was basically make it so guys wouldn't see their kids anymore. Um, and put them in jail. Uh, I wasn't prosecuting, like I'd set it up with prosecutors. Um, make it so that they wouldn't have any contact with anybody. Make sure they go to jail if they don't pay their child support. Um, if it wasn't money, if they were trying to give them wood or trying to give them meat or something like that, not good enough, you know, that's not my job. My job was to, to make them pay, basically, and, and to not let go. I got to be a real good bulldog, but you know, some of those were my cousins. Other ones were guys that I could tell that they could probably come back around if they had somebody who cared about them at all. Um, I, mean, I knew a lot of these guys. And so that wasn't always the best solution, probably. I mean, and, and still, I can't go home. If there's, there's a few guys, I'll go home and I'll see them, and they'll get crazy in their eyes right away because of what I did to them. Um, there's a few guys who can't handle the sight of me because I did my job really well. Well, that's probably not the best way to be in that. I probably could be something more. I could, I could be somebody more than that. But I could probably bring some harmony to my community instead of that discord, right? So that's where peacemaking comes in because uh, kind of one of the next neat phases that I got, of work that I got to do at home was uh, we had a kind of a groundswell of community effort over about a decade or so. And I got called into it at one point to help draft a code. And we did a really innovative abused and neglected children's code. Um, and our task there was we, we listened to elders, we had an elders panel, and uh, they told us the way it needed to be. <clears throat> and they taught us um, the kind of the, the Lakota language concepts that we needed to know that maybe weren't on the surface that you know those of us in Lakota as a second language type speakers understood. They, they took us a layer deeper to really understand uh, what's going on in the children and the family situation. Um, in our tradition, you know, when in our language is where that's important. And then you know my job was to write a code that would match that, plus that would meet all of the federal requirements so that the tribe could continue to get funding. So. Uh, as an example, we had to have stuff like um, termination of parental rights had to be in the code, but tribally that doesn't make any sense traditionally. It doesn't make any sense. So that, you know, we had to drop that section in there, but then also leave room for traditional ways of thinking about things to work out, which is you never terminate a, parent, a parent's rights. In fact, a parent doesn't really have rights. It's the child's rights. You know, that's a, that's a foreign concept to English-speaking language, right? But English-speaking law, but. Uh, but the child has rights in our viewpoint, and it's a child's right to know their family, to know their, their nuclear family, to know their extended family. Um, the extended family has a right to talk and to have a say and stuff kind of in addition to the nuclear family. So it's just a whole different system, basically. And the task was to make room for that. Well, that thing took off. It, and it also included some family group decision making, kind of formal, but kind of based on the Maori model, really. But uh, just basically, we carved away spaces, kind of like a diversion where where that could happen, just create space for this idea of talking about things. And 
when it happened, it wasn't really a Maori model. It was the Lakotas talking about what they're going to do with this family that's having some issues, you know, leave some space and some facilitation. So um, this was really cool. This was making space for indigenous stuff to happen again within the mainstream kind of imposed system and, and, and uh, being strategic about that. You know, we, we had provisions that we needed to have in there in order to get the funding to keep the funding going through. Um, we had provisions to allow for the fact that some families were more assimilated than others, I guess you'd have to say, and that they would prefer to do stuff the mainstream way too. And so we just kind of accommodate all the people within the nation. Um, so that was pretty neat. And that's, you know, that opens up a whole range of possibilities. So, so the reason I'm here is because I've already seen what the benefits can be with doing stuff from a native perspective within a native community as opposed to the imposed system of kind of walk both sides of that line. And, and uh, I'm all in on this stuff. When they, when they open this job up at NARP, I jumped at it and I just feel blessed to, to do the work that I do every day. And excited to get to know you all and hopefully get to know you for the rest of my career. So, so thanks. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Cheryl, who's going to wow us all. Good morning again, and a special thank you to our Cherokee hosts and to Peacemaker Julie for really setting that sacred space. And peacemaking is about setting the sacred space and bringing our voice to difficult situations. And when you all introduced yourselves um, from your different nations, who you work for, I was really, really jazzed about, wow, you know, so many Native people are here, people who understand our way of life, and we are beginning to put the Indian back into Indian law. And that is not an easy thing. And fortunately, I, you know, looking at the peacemakers out in the audience, I learned so much from the peacemakers, and in my language I say Gunesh Chish, and thank you. And so today I want to share some ideas, and I'm going to talk about indigenous concepts of justice and different peacemaking models, and how that can have a positive impact on our communities. Because as you know, many of our communities are in such strife. And um, my dad, who was one of my greatest teachers, said he never thought he'd see the day when it was Indian versus Indian. And now that's happening in our tribes over and over and over. And I do borrow from my father, who was one of my greatest teachers. And he taught me a lot about our way of life, and we're a subsistence culture. I'm from Prince of Wales Island in southeast Alaska even though I made my way down to the lower 48. Um, and we were talking uh, in his living room, and the killer whales were coming in. And they're very significant to our people. And one of my sons is Dekijoth. And his Indian name means a killer whale circling way out in the outer waters after a seal kill. And Dad and I were talking, and I was telling him about the law and American justice and American jurisprudence, and I'm a lawyer, and blah, blah, blah. And he was looking at me like, oh my god. And um, he said, well, what about our law? And I go, our law? Oh my god. You know, I'm schooled in American jurisprudence, Dad, not the traditional laws of the Hinyokwan people. And he was, there was a sadness there. And he was like, man, I sent you to school for that? And so he was always challenging me. And I talk about the killer whale because when you lift up the ocean, there are the killer whale people. And they're there. Their main purpose is to teach you kindness. And it's such a simple concept, but an important one as we begin to explore how we can make change within our respective communities. Because many people said it was impossible, absolutely impossible. 
We love our black. I love my black robe and my gown. You know, I like that. And our people like that. Our people, and not to disrespect that, of course. But there are other ways to do things, especially as Native people, when we have a continuing relationship with each other, like we have. We have to do something different. We have to move from adversarial into something that is more holistic, more like ourselves. And so I borrow from Margaret Mead, who said, and one of the peacemakers from the UN, I mean, the UN has a section on peacemaking. Um, I borrowed this from a person who is a peacemaker who has discussed this in over 100 countries. And when I listened to her, she quoted Margaret Mead, and I thought, wow, it really rung with me because never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I look at um, our brothers and sisters from Pachanga, and I remember when they were just talking about it. And no, we want to do it. No, we're in a public law 280. I don't know if anyone is qualified. You know, and that small group of people just kept generating. One person had it as a thought at law school. We need a court, you know. And that small group of people has sustained us through generations and generations of who we are as, as the indigenous people of North America. Um, many of the peacemakers have to bear with me because you know I have these five principles that I put myself through as I'm thinking about projects, as I'm thinking about how am I going to work with the tribe, how am I going to be a better person, whether it's a mother, grandmother, now I'm a great grandmother. Um, so I've always said we've been facing the wrong way, and it's time to turn around and revitalize our own values and our own way of life. Also to understand the impact of federal policy. Each one of us in here has been impacted by deliberate federal policy that was develop to terminate and assimilate us. We have to pay attention because many of the, our people are before the courts and they have been impacted by the historical trauma that has been passed from generation to generation. And we really need to have a session totally just on that. <clears throat> Understanding the significance of oral tradition. As a lawyer, I love to write it and have piles of paper. I even brought my paper here with me because I was so nervous. And I had to learn that our oral tradition is really <coughs> the glue that has kept us together against the strongest country in the world. And it's that oral tradition that has been passed from generation to generation. And I really didn't get it until I was working with the Pueblo Cochini. And they do not have a constitution. They have one piece of paper that has their laws for consistency. And it's that oral tradition, that presence of being there and the power of the spoken word that makes a difference. Re-educate the educated. Many of us here have had the benefit of an education, and I don't take that for granted at all. I appreciate it, and but as professionals, it's time for us to pause and rethink that. And again, the call for unity. Um, as I said, we have a lot of striving. Many of our communities, our families, are, you know, we're lucky to have families. And our leadership really needs our prayers and our strength. So when I say we've been facing the wrong way, we become a replication society. Be like someone else. Be like the federal court, the state court. <coughs> and Grappo wrote a law review on tribal courts. And Justice Briscoe said, yeah, our tribal courts are always under scrutiny. And it's interesting that people like us, we're going to make the difference. Because he said, our tribal courts are nothing but a pale replication of American justice in both conception and operation. Some of the tribal courts are little more than pale copies of the white system 
Remedies to their operational problems are directed toward making them better copies. I don't think that's what we're about. You know, we have to think about that. Turn around and value who we are, value our indigenous ways, value our way of life. So, it's interesting America is looking for a new justice and we're trying to replicate the American system? No, we have to pause and think that through. And I spoke earlier about the impact of federal policy. This is the federal policy broken into concepts that we have had to deal with. When we were intact, our sovereignty was intact before the encounter, and our sovereignty is still intact, but it's on fragile ground. The removal era was one of the most devastating eras, and we we're lucky to be here with the Cherokee Nation. And we all fought for baby Veronica. And 4,000 of their people perished in that trail of tears. And for them to be here and we're enjoying their hospitality and enjoying their culture is a miracle. So something is right in that Cherokee language, in that Cherokee law that has kept them together through a lot of these devastating policies. Of course, the reservation era was um, to isolate us, and there was military and civilian mentality. And when you have that military mentality, it is something we have to pay attention to because a lot of that has um, transferred into our generations. The allotment era, uh, we lost a lot of our land base. That is when our individual rights first began to perk its head and when we're used to being communal landholders, sharing with each other, and all of a sudden it's I, I, me, me, and we lost a lot of our land base during that time. The IRA was, um, when I read about it, I thought, wow, this is when we begin to turn the corner. But we're facing a lot of the issues that were started through the IRA, IRA era when you began to replicate a tribal constitution, model it after the US Constitution, put aside your traditional governments, and borrow. And today we're feeling that pressure. Um, the termination era was one of our most devastating areas. I'm from Alaska and we feel it the most. We have the highest rate of kids in foster care than anyone in the country. And our kids are still being placed in non-Indian homes. We had major loss of language, movement to the cities. I don't think Justice Briscoe minds this, but his family was part of relocation. And I just can't imagine Americans moving people from out of their homelands into another era. That has an impact on us. Self-determination, of course, we begin to see the spark of hope and self-governance when it's up to us now. It's up to us to make the difference. It's up to us never to replicate these policies. And we can begin to replicate them when we write a code a certain way that is against our way of And again, this is the, <clears throat> maybe, I don't know if you can see that, but can we turn down the light just to so <coughs> maybe in front of this? But that are thousands, hundreds and thousands of kids that were removed. That is just a wall of children. And I think that speaks for itself because many of us have been products of boarding school. Many of us have felt this impact and our families were deliberately destroyed, our way of government was. So I talked about the oral tradition and it's what makes me Klingit and you Navajo, or you Alabama Kishada, or Cherokee. That's where we get the clarity. That's where we bring the authenticity to the table. Yes, sometimes it's through stories, through songs, but it's passed and given with respect from generation to generation. And we have to understand this oral tradition because if we don't get it, we're quick to begin interpreting different things. 
So music custom is essential for our cultural survival. And the Indian common law comes directly from our native language and our cultural viewpoint. And that becomes the distinct, unique law of Pachanga, of Alabama Pachata, of Cherokee. It is our way of life. It doesn't have to be mysterious or we forgot who we were. No, when you get the right of people together, it begins to revitalize, it begins to bubble up so strong. And the elders begin to be valued instead of put away in a home. They're valued for their knowledge, their wisdom. And the oral tradition, as I said, was the glue that kept us together in the face of those severe termination and assimilation policies of the federal government. So re-educate the educated. We must pause and rethink not only our education, but our government structures. And we, our tribal courts are fairly new. They've been put to the test over and over. And due to our Western education model, many of our indigenous ways were put aside because we want to be like someone else. We don't want to be like ourselves. So we have to re-educate ourselves, pause, and think, how can we as tribal professionals bring our thinking into a court system? It's not an easy thing to do because we're so used to borrowing from the outside. Never to replicate, and um, it can happen because it can happen so subtly, and I use the senior citizens as an example. Um, <clears throat> all of a sudden, the senior citizens were eating together, they were having, my mother loves it. She goes and she sits with her colleagues, her old friends from way back, and they talk, gossip, they run the tribe from their little lunch, basically. All of a sudden, funding is cut, and someone delivers it in a styrofoam um, uh, carton. No interaction, no love, just one simple little line that was taken out of, of the way the tribe was going to relate to their elders. And so we have to be careful because we have been blessed with a Western education. Now we need to use that as a tool to protect our sovereignty, to strengthen our tribal courts. And what is indigenous justice? I got a piece of, oh my God, she went back to the blanket. And I couldn't even say peacemaking, you know, because Tlingit people were not really peacemakers. We like to argue and fight a lot. And, um, but what we do have is we have relationships that are very, very important. And so indigenous justice really stresses the relationship and our respective reciprocal responsibilities amongst our families, our clans, and our nation. And our customary law has been in place for centuries. Like the Cherokee people, they survived those termination policies. And I was here meeting with um, <coughs> the Cherokee Nation and listened to how they gave baby Veronica her Indian name and the beauty of that. And they knew she had to have the strength that they gave her a powerful, strong name. And our laws, yes, predate the US Constitution. Pay attention to that. And they're very compatible with universal um, recognized principles and values. Of course, we have our traditional and customary law. And I borrow from Professor Christine Zuni Cruz, who has been at the forefront at the university pushing this agenda. Um, she says this law is oral and has been passed from generation to generation. Of any given community, it's not entirely accessible or contained in one place like written law. And some of our laws may never ever be shared with the outside. It's unique to ourselves. It's internal, oral, and for the most part, dynamic and not static. In other words, it's changing. <clears throat> what is in books? 
Um, I borrowed from my dad, and he always said, if we have our Indian language, we will always have the custom and laws of our community and how we relate to each other, always pushing that relationship. And I compliment the Alabama Kushana peacemakers who are here because I witnessed them using their native language, and when they bring their native language to peacemaking, do process, every process. When I see them operating in their native language, the people begin to relax. The people begin to move to a healing. It's their language. They understand it. And I compliment the tribe in terms of how they bring their native language to ensure due process. So, Ada Pecos Mountain, she's from Hamas Pueblo. Um, she has written on this and says, it is a holistic philosophy and the worldview of who we are as indigenous people of North America. The systems are guided by unwritten customary laws, traditions, and practices. And I know Lisa um, Rosalie Chavez is here from San Felipe Pueblo. And it is amazing to see how the Pueblo people along the Rio Grande, they don't call it peacemaking, but they have this absolute beautiful, holistic way of keeping their community intact with their own language, with their own laws. And many, most, are all unwritten practices. Mainly learned by example through the oral tradition of the tribal elders. It is a circle of justice that connects everyone. And I really learned the consensus rule over at Cochiti Pueblo. I was the attorney, I had the answer, and over there, the tribal council, everyone who has been governor serves as a councilman. And they have the consensus rule where everyone has a chance to speak. And I thought, hey, we don't have to have everyone speak. I think I have the answer. And the governor is looking at me like, you already spoke. You know, and I'm like, hey, you know, and everyone has a chance to speak. It's beautiful. Um, as lawyers, if there's a pause, we're going to jump in there with the answer. So anyway. Um, so these are the universal native principles, and I've worked with um, tribes, and I can't emphasize this enough because Sometimes when we're talking about peacemaking, it's like, oh my God, we forgot our tradition. Oh my God, we don't have our language. Oh my God, oh my God. Yes, we do. We have our way of life. And it's that way of life that we can bring to the table because it's based on relationships. It's based on our oral tradition. It's based on the universal law of respect. Now I pass that up because we in uh, Clinket country uh, have this, and it's our way of life. And we, the elders said, use these. We have them on the refrigerator. We have them everywhere. And so um, I like it because sometimes we have to dig deep down inside of us to remember those principles that were so dear to who we are as the indigenous people. And we have to make sure those are the principles that we are furthering for the seven generations to come. Because, as a judge from California told me, we are the seventh generation. Someone prayed for us so we could be here. So I'm going to take five minutes only for you to work with in threes, not in twos, not in ones, in threes, to come up with a principle from your tribe that we're going to share with the total group. Threes, a principle from your tribe. Go. Not twos, threes. <coughs> Only five minutes. And pick a spokesperson. <laughs>
for, uh, for our group. The other two were fairness to the group, fairness to tribal members, fairness to individuals, and number three was empathy or uh, an understanding, a sense of walking in the other person's shoes and uh, understanding what that person and that culture is. In our particular tribe, we emphasize the use of our tribal language. They say there are no Indians in Texas, but uh, we beg to differ. We are here, we've been in Texas since 1787 approximately. So uh, people have marveled at our survival because uh, they say there are no Indians in Texas, but uh, we have our own language, we have our own tribal court, we have our own peacemaker court. We have, uh, as a number two principle, respect for others. And uh, number three, patience for others. Hi there, everybody. Um, so some of the principles that we found within our group was um, basically family and under the under families like or under the broader umbrella of like relationships. Um, having mutual respect and understanding these relationships and how they uh, relate to one another. Uh, and then within each relationship, understanding the responsibility that each party has to one another. And then um, with fairness comes the idea of like redirecting and looking back at who you are and how what you're doing is affecting others um, in your community. Hello, um, I'm Michael Smith, and um, our group, we, uh, I'm a Chickasaw, and I'm a judge for the Second Fox Nation, and this gentleman is from the Cree Nation uh, in Canada, and this young lady um, represents several tribes in Nevada, Utah, excuse me, oops. Uh, so we kind of, we're from different places, but I think we came to universal thought, um, uh, communal sharing of resources, I think that's kind of a tribal tradition, uh, also a belief in a uh, higher power, and um, wisdom in culture and tradition and elders. I think that's kind of universal in all tribal things, and since we're all different, Preserving the integrity of family unity and respecting those who have came before you. Uh, we had a rough road time coming up with this. Uh, our tribe is going through an election first next month, and we're very good at arguing and disagreeing with each other. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, <laughs> As far as traditions, uh, I think passing uh, our culture down to our children, uh, our language, our dances, our different cultures such as the smoke culture and everything, uh, but that's basically it. Yeah, um, I got pointed out to do this <laughs> for our group. And, uh, our group all, all happened to be, all three of us just happened to be from uh, from one tribe. Payam Kowichim Atachim, which is our word for uh, people of the West, and reservations of Chonga in Southern California. Uh, we got named Lusania by the missionaries. Anyhow, um, the ones we came up with, which hopefully the other two at the table will agree, we did it together. <laughs> um, the first one, well, no particular order really, but everyone has a voice. And specifically what I mean by that, and I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we're a non-Iron tribe. Um, 
which means we, we develop our own constitution. And the people truly have the power in our tribe. Um, the, the tribal council is not an executive council. They can't, they have to bring everything to the people. Sometimes they can do a lot of planning and, and they can come up with a brilliant PowerPoint to try to steer what's going to happen on the floor, but they have to bring everything to the people. So the people really do have a voice. Um, I think it's mostly good, but sometimes the decisions get made emotionally, so maybe not always. Um, also, the way we take care of our people is really evident. Um, there's a lot of emphasis on caring for the children and uh, programs for children, and also uh, a respect for the elders. Uh, I think that's universal in Indian country, of course, respect for the elders. Um, and just kind of a personal note, sometimes I, I don't want to throw anybody under the bus, but one of our council members, um, I'm on a constitution committee where we're writing right now, and at a recent meeting with council, he rolled his eyes and said, I guess we'll just have to wait for them to die. And uh, that's a terrible thing to say, but what he meant by that is, is um, you know, sometimes we respect certain groups so much that um, we're just going to go along, even though maybe sometimes it's not always the best thing. Um, and then uh, the observation in my tribe, and again, it's probably everywhere, that uh, the family, the families tend to group together. Um, and those ties are powerful. Um, oftentimes families vote as entire blocks for uh, councils uh, membership. And uh, of course, if you're running for something, you need to make alliances with those large blocks. Um, and then we see it with where people sit in, in, in meetings um, where they actually are oftentimes, and I think uh, perhaps a lot of us don't even realize that we're sitting uh, by clan. If we go back to our old family names, um, there might be four, five, six different uh, modern surnames in a group, but they're all in one clan. And uh, I, think, I think a lot of us aren't even aware of it, that, that that's what we do. And then uh, the voting may or may not block like that. It's kind of more of the individual families within those clans that block together. So that's, that's our three.
changes, um, but really our task is to make those changes within ourselves.
Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. As you can see, there were so many universal values, and those are the values that you want your peacemakers, your judges, your tribal leadership, your children, your grandchildren to embrace. And you really have to take the time to think those through. And now that it's dark, oh my God. Look at how many wonderful universal thoughts and a lot of them were re reaffirmed as what our elders said in Alaska. And I think we have to pay attention to that because as the indigenous people, we have so much to share with each other. And I thank you all for sharing. And so, and I put those down because I like to, So these are your group, your group voice. And it's important that we have a group voice because as Indian people, our voice has not been heard. And often our voice happens after the meeting. So we really wanted you to get into participatory mode for the next couple days and really share. And um, peacemaking, let's get back to that why. Again, I said, whenever you have a continuing relationship with one another, we have to do something different. Otherwise, we're splitting our community. And we do not have the benefit of anonymity in our respective communities, because everyone knows each other. They see you at the one stop. They see you at Walmart. They see you at the restaurant. So process is critical. And I want you to think about process, because when we have the right process, we're moving toward healing. Okay. And the law evolves from that process. So we don't need volumes of statutes. Because when you're in that peacemaking session, some of it is evolving. The use of native language is key. Participation by all is necessary. And consensus is necessary. And I heard people say there about spirituality. We have the opportunity as the indigenous people to bring our spirituality into the forum. Therefore, we're moving toward healing. I borrowed from the Ikkana Ikpi of the great Choctaw Nation, and Chief Justice Briscoe is a peacemaker and the Chief Justice, and he's going to talk a little bit more about this. But when we decided to develop that court over there, there was a lot of discussion, you know. And fortunately, the chief and um, uh, attorney general said, take it, take this court, build the court. And so we talked about the peacemaker. And so the peacemaker is established by ordinance there, tribal ordinance. And there was the challenge, should we make, name it the peacemaker court or what should we name the court? And over there they said, let's name it the Itikana Ikbi. And so they began to bring their native language at the Tonga Omish Yomish. And so the native language, words have power. And so how you begin to develop your court, bring your own language into it. And so the peacemaker model really focuses on process, like I said and making things right to repair. In America, everyone's focusing on restorative justice, which is very complimentary. Prayers are used in, to create the sacred space. To create the sacred space. And as you notice, we created the sacred space this morning, like I said, with Peacemaker Julie and with that beautiful Cherokee song. I've tried it with prayer, I've tried it without prayer. Guess what works? Prayer. Um, can be used in both in civil and criminal. Builds on trust and relationships to promote healing. I will tell you in law school, I don't think I ever heard healing once. But in Indian country, we really have to move toward that healing. Because it doesn't matter if we're fighting for sovereignty and our kids are being left behind, our elders are being abused, our women are being abused. So we have to move toward that healing. No attorney representation. It doesn't mean attorneys can't be there. It just means that attorneys can't be representing. The people are speaking for themselves 
with their own voice. And um, no um, talk and discussion are necessary. Native language can be used, no time limit. We're going to take the time here. And the community right may supersede the individual right. And when you've been schooled in individual rights, it's very difficult sometimes to get to the community right. And we see out Sonica, when Cherokee Nation stepped up, that's our child. She just doesn't belong to an individual. Um, apologies in Indian country are favored. When apologies have um, a lot of um, weight, and not often it may be like a lot of talk about respect, family, it may be to the clan or family. Forgiveness is essential. And in peacemaking, it is memorialized into an agreement and order, so it's enforceable. And we can also give full faith and credit and comedy. Our peacemaker orders have been honored by state courts and vital statistics. Um, prayer is the completion, and to put it aside, never to, you know, to bring it up. So the beginning and ending. And sometimes, I noticed um, with the peacemakers, sometimes, and I just thought a lot about this, um, I've seen the peacemakers end in prayer, and they may have forgot something in the session, because the sessions are pretty volatile sometimes, and pretty stressful. Sometimes you forget certain things, but the peacemakers always manage to bring it up at the ending in their prayer. It's, it's magical. So indigenous justice, um, Judge Nikki, who served as the Chief Justice for the Mississippi Band of Choctaw, said, it is a way to put some of our people's way into the justice system. And that's the challenge, is how can you put some of your own ways into a justice system? So the peacemaker rules, open with prayer, introductions, even though you may know each other, the introductions are important because it's important to understand each person's role and to hear the voice of the participants. When we heard your voice, it made a difference. It made me feel empowered because sometimes we don't hear back our own thinking. We're hearing back someone else's thinking. Um, statement of the issues by the party filing the complaint. Everyone will have a chance to speak, so you only have one sixth. Uh, of the time, and I use this example of I was doing a session in New Mexico, and I love the native language. I let um, uh, respect for elders, I let um, elder woman go off for over 30 minutes, and I thought, oh my God, I just totally lost control of the situation. And she was giving it to everyone, and I couldn't understand the language. so. It's important to set those ground rules because you have to honor each other in the circle so everyone is getting a chance to bring their voice to the table. There's nothing worse than being left out or you think you've done such a bang up job and someone's issue is still percolating over there. So, be tough on the issue and gentle on the person. In Indian country, we're tough on the person. We don't even know what the issue is. So you have to shift that. And listen to learn. Only one person talks at a time. One person will speak at a time, and others would sit there and think. Listening is more important, and I love what John Burpee said. He said that at Pachanga, they would greet each other and speak to each other, and there were pauses. And I remember that at home too. And it sometimes we feel uncomfortable with those pauses, but we have to let that happen. So sometimes there was silent, silent, silence, and let it be at peace. It will happen. Don't rush in and move it. Discussion, apology, forgiveness, consensus is critical. So I wanted to emphasize this. Be tough on the issue and gentle. Consensus and listening are important because we have that continuing relationship that we want to maintain within our respective communities. So, one of the, uh, um, I was working with some peacemakers and she said, it's important 
to listen to understand. We don't have to respond. And as lawyers, we're taught to boom, respond right now. And sometimes we don't have to respond, but we really have to understand. So, um, okay, creation of the court. As we heard from Tonga, they have a different system. They have a tribal constitution. Lisa's people have no written constitution. It's an oral constitution. It doesn't mean they're lawless. Yes, they have laws. They're oral. And of course, we have written constitutions. And the peacemaker can be a division of the judicial branch. Why? The peacemaker, um, the process in hearing are different than an adversarial court. The qualifications of the judges are different. And so you have to be, pay attention to that and not try to bring your assimilation, your Western thinking into that because we're operating within the customary and traditional laws of the tribe. So the purpose of the peacemaker is to provide a forum, use of traditional law to resolve disputes, and it's the traditional and customary law that are emphasized. The jurisdiction, you can have original jurisdiction where individuals can come in and file a petition. And it's not mediation. Mediation is a different American concept. So pay attention to your code and how you write it because some tribes may want it to be a mediation court. And I know at Alabama Cushada, we use family conferencing more as a mediation and um, try to get things settled prior to um, going into court. So what are the qualifications? In some of the courts, it's a minimum of uh, 30 years of age. I know Chief Justice Briscoe was barely 30, but he's um, now getting um, seasoned. Um, and I remember sitting on the interview committee and there was quite a discussion about, hey, this is a kid coming in to be a judge? No. We need someone who's older and who has more life experiences. And it was quite a controversy. And, um, but Res Ipsa Loquiter, he sits here as the Chief Justice for Mississippi Band of Choctaw. Why? Because his tribe invested in him. They believed in Choctaw self-determination. And it was beautiful because he used peacemaking principles as a youth court judge and begin to bring healing to his tribe. Good, and he could relate to the kids much better than us oldies, you know. No felony violations, good moral character, read, write, and understand English, speak and understand native language, familiar with tribal codes, member of the tribe, and each tribe has different qualifications. So these are just suggestions and borrowing from And the oath is important, the oath to take that oath in front of the council, in front of your people. Um, I remember when the peacemakers at uh, Alabama Cushada were sworn in, and it was amazing. Because when you're taking the oath, you are really, it's a long oath, but I just clipped this part. To resolve disputes through the use of customary and traditional and as a peacemaker, you have the duty to bring that into your court. So, in some tribes, as a senior peacemaker, I can hardly wait for I heard two senior peacemakers, there's probably others here, but when the peacemakers begin to meet each other, they bring a different kind of energy. I was there when the peacemaker from Choctaw first met the Navajo peacemakers. It was so powerful. It was so amazing. They hardly had to say anything to each other. They just connected. The applicable law, we talked about this, traditional customary law. That's why you have to understand oral tradition because a lot of it may not be written. Okay? Um, usually there's contempt power to compel attendance. And pay attention to your tribal codes. You can use your tribal codes for guidance. It's a voluntary proceeding. It's common sense that people are coming to the peacemaker to resolve disputes. They don't have it figured out. So one of your first um, uh, 
I guess, challenges is to make sure you review the rules with them and the peacemaking process so they understand it. Because many of our tribal people, they don't understand what the peacemaking is about. They don't want to have anything to do with those peacemakers. Who do they think they are? They're from our community. They have more problems than the average Joe. No, so you have to explain the process. Then the parties can make an informed decision whether or not they want to be before the peacemaker court. It's a two-step process in terms of getting to the agreement and order. We put, um, it's by consensus, so everyone agrees to what happens in peacemaking. It's put into an order because we mean business, because we, some people think, oh, we're going to peacemaking, it's easier. No, it's a little bit more challenging. And there still has to be compliance. And we always put a savings clause in the order, and we call it reconsideration, in case we've made a mistake. In case it wasn't exactly right, there's a reconsideration where individuals can come in and have that corrected. No use of civil procedure, no criminal codes, no rules of evidence upon it. And if you can't resolve, it may have to be transferred out, because not every situation is for peacemaking. Sometimes it will have to go into an adversarial setting. Yes, and um, the senior peacemaker is going to talk more about that this in her session. But at Alabama Kishana and at the different peacemaking courts, baskets are used, and it's so amazing because it's a talking tool. And they use their traditional basket, and no one speaks unless um, they have the basket. And it really creates the sacred space, and it also helps the individuals before the court have a voice, it empowers them to speak. And there's a lot of tears and laughter in that basket, but the basket has become a sacred talking tool. And of course, the basket um, is very sacred and it invokes that rule of respect. So when you have the basket, it brings your...